I was looking through some of the um, photography collections um, recently, uh, partly because I'm changing the um, photographs that I currently have for sale. And it occurred to me that I don't really speak very much about the animals themselves. So I thought I'd start a, a kind of mini series that I'll run every few weeks, just do a new one every few weeks, where I talk about a particular animal that I've uh, photographed and really tell you a bit more about the animal because I think there are often things um, that we don't know and I've certainly learned a lot through photographing animals and then doing research on them and um, yeah I've, I've learned things that I wasn't aware of so I found it an interesting journey so I hope you'll find these podcasts interesting as well. So I'm going to start with uh, elephants. Now um if you didn't know, <laughs> they're the largest living land animal that we have on the planet um, currently. They, you can find them in sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And basically they're the, the survivors, if you like, of a group of animals that also includes woolly mammoths, which most of us are familiar with, and um, also the mastodon, which is a, a North American animal. So that, that group has evolved as with all animal groups. Some um, species within the group have survived and others haven't done so well. Now, um, just to give you an idea, so I'm going to throw a lot of facts at you in this, but I'll try and make it more interesting. Um, elephants typically live to between 60 and 70 years of age. They reach maturity, um, so I, and I'm defining that as reaching their full height, by the time they get to about 35, so between 35 and 40 years of age. So quite a, a slow-growing, relatively long-lived um, animal. Uh, they're going to weigh anything from 3,000 to 7,500 kilograms. Now, um, I apologise to anybody who's used to pounds and feet and all of that stuff, I'm going to stay metric, so uh, there you go. <laughs> um, now, they spend a lot of their time eating, which can be anything up to um, two-thirds of their day, just eating. And they'll eat most vegetation, so that's grass, plants, bushes, fruit, tree bark, roots, anything at all like that. So they, um, they're not particularly fussy eaters. But when they are eating, they can eat anything up to, I think it's 150 kilos um, in a day. So that's why they spend so much of their time eating. Now, I'm going to talk about how that impacts their ecosystem as I work through this. But the thing about elephants is that they are what we refer to as a keystone species. And that is that when they're in an area, they have a big impact on the flora and fauna in that area. So much as in the same way a keystone will keep an arch together, if you think of an arch of um, stones or bricks, an elephant and animals like that who are defined as keystone species have a huge impact on the area that they live in and the animals that also form a part of that ecosystem. Now, um, I'm going to talk about the different species. So there are actually three recognized subspecies if you like at the moment um you've got the african bush elephant which is um also known as the savanna elephant if you think of an african elephant that's probably the elephant that you're thinking of there is also um a, a species called the african forest elephant now they uh live in the congo basin i don't even have numbers for them but it's quite a small population of animals uh they differentiate from the bush elephant uh, because they have straighter tusks and they have a more, more rounded ears. So the, the differences between them are fairly subtle, but they have been defined as separate species, whereas the African desert elephant, which, it, which was at one stage defined as a subspecies, and they're in um, uh, Namibia and Mali, they're now regarded as African bush elephants, even though they look slightly different, but that put down more to diet and then of course the other major species is the asian elephant and um, they look a little bit different so i'm going to talk about the differences um, in uh, in a moment 
So, in fact, I'm going to talk about them right now because I'm referring to some notes I made earlier just to make sure I don't forget anything important. So, very briefly, if you were to look at the two elephants, and let's talk about the um, the African bush elephant, the savannah elephant, and the Asian elephant. If they're side by side, the African can get taller, so the bulls will grow up to about four meters in height and weigh about seven and a half thousand kilograms, whereas the Asian will grow up to three and a half meters in height and weigh up to about six thousand kilos. So the Asian is a little bit smaller. Probably the most obvious difference between the two is their ears. So the African elephant has very large ears, which obviously they use for cooling, whereas the Asian elephant has much smaller ears, and they're they're obviously smaller. So even if you don't have an African elephant to compare against, you you will immediately see it's a much smaller um, ear. Now, there are some more subtle things um, that differentiate the two as well. The first is the head. So... On an Asian elephant, it has what we refer to as a twin-domed head. There's an indentation in the middle of the head, and and then the bumps on the head are referred to as dorsal bumps. But basically, the Asian, if you look at it, look at it, has two bumps on its head, whereas the African is just a single dome for its for its head. Another difference is in the tusks. So in the African elephant, the tusks, and I'm going to talk about those in a bit more detail in a moment. But both males and females have tusks, whereas with the Asian elephant, it's just the males that have tusks. And then, even more subtly, (laughs) if you look at the tip of the trunk, and the trunk's an amazing um, piece of equipment on, uh, on both species, but if you look at the tips, the tip of the trunk, the African elephant has what we refer to as two fingers. So they're actually two projections at the end of the trunk that look a little bit like fingers, whereas the Asian only has a single finger on the end of the trunk. So that means the African elephant can pick things up with these fingers on the tip of its trunk. Uh, So it gives it uh, the ability, to, in a a very kind of fine-tuned way, to pick up very small objects, whereas the Asian elephant doesn't have that ability. Uh, Now, the skin on the um, African elephant tends to be more wrinkled, uh, it tends to be more uniform in colour, whereas on the Asian elephant, you, you tend to get more spots. Sometimes there are more pinkish areas and it's a smoother skin. So that, broadly speaking, that I think the main difference is between the two. And that's how you can tell one from the other. Obviously, if you're in a particular part of the world, if you're in Africa, you're more likely to see an African elephant. If you're in Asia, um, you're more likely to um, see an Asian elephant. But that's another clue. OK, so... Just to give you an idea of populations, now the bad news is that certainly with the African elephant, in the last 100 years, 90% or or it's estimated that 90% of the animals um, that were around 100 years ago have now gone. And the population is estimated at somewhere around the 300,000 to 400,000 mark. So that's the number of African elephants in the wild. So on the the upside, about 400,000 animals. With the Asian elephant, there's far fewer. There's between forty and 50,000 Asian elephants in the wild, and that has a direct impact on um, how they're um, rated in terms of their um, their potential to go extinct. The African elephant is rated as vulnerable, whereas the Asian elephant is rated as endangered. So um, the bad news is that unless we do really take care with both elephant, um, both of the, the major elephant groups, but particularly with the Asian, uh, they're likely to disappear. So looking at um, how they group, broadly speaking, and I've, I've got a bit of poetic license here as well, but broadly they're the same, but they'll tend to form groups and the group is, uh, these are known as herds obviously, and they're led by the dominant female. So it's a matriarchal society. And it's typically the oldest female that runs the the herd or the group. And that can be anywhere in size from anything as small as eight animals up to about 100. And occasionally you get aggregations, so presumably collections of groups, maybe around water holes at certain times of year, where there could be as many as 1,000 elephants. So that would be a huge collection of animals, obviously. 
Now, also within that group are all the female um, animals and then all the young animals. So what I mean by that is any animals that are prepubescent. This really applies to the males because once they reach around anywhere from sort of 12 to 15 years, once they hit puberty, they then leave the group. And often males will spend most of the rest of their life on their own, traveling on their own. And it was thought until very recently, and I read something, I think it was about three years old now, that elephants didn't form what's referred to as bachelor herds. So most grazing mammals will form bachelor herds. They often have this similar sort of setup where the main herds with the females um, tend to have a dominant male. They won't have many competing males there, so it tend to be a dominant male and then the young animals and the female animals. But you'll also find groups that are just male, so they're referred to as bachelor herds. And it was thought until very recently, until um, a, a bachelor herd of elephants was found in Namibia, that elephants didn't do that, but apparently they do. And I think this underlines as well that as much as we like to think we know a lot about these animals, and it's, it's fair to say we do know a fair bit, there's always new things we can find out about them and their behaviours. And this is what, to me, makes um, a lot of this um, that, well, wildlife in general very interesting and also wildlife conservation, wildlife photography. Okay, so some other things that might be interesting to you, you might, you might not know. Um, elephants can hear what's known as infrasound, so that's very, very low frequency sounds, uh, much lower than our ears can can hear. And um, that means they can pick up vibration and noise through the ground, through their skin, through their bones. And it's a way that they can communicate. And one of the advantages of um, using infrasound is that it can travel very large large distances. So anything up to 20, 25 k's, kilometres, um, or possibly even further. So they can hear storms coming, things like that, long before we would. And it's also um, a form of uh, communication that they have. So um, again, that was something I only learned about fairly recently. Now, um, something I did grow up with was a thing called the elephant's graveyard, which you may have um, heard about. Um, it, I think it was put together by early explorers, African explorers, because they didn't um, see elephants dying. They, they didn't find elephant remains except, the, and, and I believe they found them in large groups of elephants. So this whole story about elephants going off to this sort of mythical elephant's graveyard to die, that whole story started. Well, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, whichever way you care to view it, that is a myth. And um, where you do get these large collections of elephant bones is probably where there was a drought and they'd gone to a waterhole um, maybe the kind of last resort water hole to try and find enough water to survive and they all unfortunately all died and it's unfortunately this is um, what happens around these areas these water holes in situations of extreme drought um, animals and this is particularly true of the matriarch in um, um, a mammal herd these animals know where to find water in almost any situation and this is why they lead the herd so they can take the herd to find water. They know where to find food. They know the migration paths if they perform an annual migration. So all of that is what the matriarch, if you like, brings to the party. That's what the, the animal does. Now, I've spoken about this in another podcast, but when I was in um, Zimbabwe at uh, Nakavango, the guy who was leading the conservation program there very, very experienced guy with many, many years of experience in the field. And he was telling the story of what they used to do, and I think it's still done in some places, is that where you have a local overpopulation of elephants, and I've mentioned they're a keystone species, so although their numbers are greatly reduced, you still have a problem if there are more elephants in an area than that area can support. What they used to do was just take a group of them, take a number of those elephants and just relocate them somewhere else, tranquilize them, stick them in a truck or use a helicopter, whatever it might be, to relocate them somewhere else. And they have done this with small herds, but what they found was that the matriarch in that situation would, would quite often go mad. And the, the, the thinking behind this, and obviously we don't know for sure, but it seems reasonable, is that the matriarch didn't know the new area. 
Suddenly she didn't know where to find water. She didn't know where to find food. She's And the rest of the herd are relying on her. Obviously young animals as well that are very dependent on her knowledge and the support of the rest of the herd. And he said that on occasion they would see the matriarch go mad. So his proposal, and this is something that I've spoken about before, which I found quite shocking when I first heard it, but again, it does make sense. Um, his proposal, if you like, or what they propose is that the, where there is an overpopulation of elephants, they take a family group and they shoot it. So, as I say, that's quite a shocking idea. But the other reason for doing that is that it's been observed many times now that elephants are not only very intelligent animals, but they seem to they've got very strong emotional bonds within their own herd. And that emotional synergy, if you like, extends to other species. So um, when I was in um, Botswana going off to uh, do some photography, the guy there was telling me about a situation. I've related this in um, other podcasts as well, I believe. It was a situation where a, a young calf had died and the mother stayed with it for three days and she'd keep stroking it with her trunk, she'd be rocking it, trying to get the calf to come back to life, as it were. And um, in the end, after three days, the rest of the group had to move on. And obviously, they had to leave the uh, the baby calf behind. And unfortunately, there were a lot of Nile crocodiles about or Circle of Life, however you want to look at it. But it, it was one of those examples where elephants do appear to grieve when uh, they lose a member of the herd. And this has also been seen where they'll come to the aid of another animal. They can bond with other animals like people, dogs and other animals. And they've also been seen to intervene when another animal is being attacked by a predator. So the very interesting animals from that perspective, from the level of their intelligence, and I, think, I believe they've got the biggest brain of any land animal, although big brains don't necessarily equate to intelligence but nonetheless it's I find it very interesting that they have this whole behavior which is is very interesting to learn about and to observe if you if you're lucky enough to have that opportunity so um just talking about the trunks for um, a moment because they're very interesting they've got around 150,000 muscles in them so they um it's the most muscular of, of any appendage, I think, of any mammal um, in terms of number of muscles um, contained within it. The When you see a young animal, a baby, they can't use their trunks immediately. So it takes them a little while, it takes them a few months to just get the grip of, of how to use their trunks. So they'll often stand on them. <laughs> um, when they're suckling, they have to use their mouth. They can't use the trunk. But once they can get to use the trunk... They obviously can breathe through it. So if they're underwater, they can use it as a snorkel. And elephants can swim, uh, but they also can use it as um, a snorkel. For baby elephants, they've been observed sucking their trunk. And it's thought that, again, this is um, a behavior very similar to human babies just sucking their thumb. Um, baby elephants will do the same thing, and presumably for comfort, which um, is, is why baby people do that. Now, um, trunks as well can lift um, an awful lot of weight, definitely up to about 350 kilos. They've been observed, if they brace themselves, to um, lift 500 kilos even of logs when they've been used to move logs. So the, the trunk is very, very strong. But as I mentioned before, they have these fingers at the end of it, and the African elephants have these two fingers. So for something that's so strong, they can also use it to do very fine, very fine gripping with the um, with their fingers, and it's in some ways similar to our arms. If you think about it, our arms are quite impressive um, limbs because, on the one hand, we can lift quite a lot of weight depending on who you are, <laughs> how much you work out, um, but on the other hand, we're very dexterous. We can do very fine work with our fingertips. So there's this combination of a sort of very broad lifting ability and then being able to do very fine work. And for an elephant, the, the trunk operates in a, in a very similar way. Now, obviously, the tusks are another key 
a feature of elephants, if you like. And as I've mentioned before, female Asian elephants don't have um, tusks. I think I said tusks then, but if I didn't, that's what I meant to say. So the tusk is basically um, a modified second incisor from the upper jaw. So they don't have them immediately. They have milk teeth initially, rather, which um, are then replaced by tusks. And tusks have an outer layer of enamel, like the other teeth, and, and that obviously protects them. And tusks continue to grow throughout the animal's life. So if you want to get an idea, just a rough idea, of how old an elephant is, you can look at its size because, as I've mentioned, it takes them a while to grow to full adult size. But another clue is how long and and how um, broad the the tusks are. So obviously an old animal will have very long tusks and um, a young animal will have very small tusks. So it's again, it gives you a rough idea just by looking at an animal, um, how old that animal is. Now, Another thing about tusks, and, and and this is another way in which elephants are similar to us, uh, you'll often see that one tusk is more worn than the other. And, and they're a bit like Swiss Army knives. They use them um, for digging. They use them to scrape bark off trees. They'll use them when they're, if they're fighting to defend themselves, although they have no uh, predators as such. Um but they tend to prefer one tusk over the other. So you'll see that one might be more worn than the other and there might be a noticeable difference between them. And this is, again, thought to be because they prefer one over the other. And it's a bit like us either being left-handed or right-handed. We prefer to use one hand over the other. So again, another um, similarity uh, between us and um, elephants Now, another thing that you might not be aware of is that elephants can sleep standing up, but they can also lie on their side and sleep. And I've seen this in, um, well, I've seen the the, uh, the track in Zimbabwe when I was tracking elephant on uh, on foot. There were two elephants we were tracking and there was a big um, indentation in the sand where one elephant had slept and you could even see a mark in the sand where its tusk had been. And... Um, earlier, before I went to Zimbabwe, I was in um, Namibia. And on one occasion, in fact, on two occasions, uh, we were in a four-wheel drive. We came uh, going down this um, dried riverbed, came around the corner, and there was a small group of, I think, five or six elephants. And there were, I think, the first time, two young elephants lying on the ground. And my first thought was I wondered if they were ill or dead, if something had happened. But in fact, they were just sleeping because the... Um, the other elephants, we'd stopped and were watching them. And the other elephants just nudged them and um, up they got and off they went. So you will see um, elephants. In, this. in fact, I saw a really good photograph that was taken by a drone as well of just a whole family of elephants asleep lying on their side. So you, they do sleep on their um, their side. Now, just talking about their skin, while I'm sort of going through, I'm kind of going in and out a bit of their, their, their physical attributes, but they do have very thick skin. It's about two and a half centimetres thick, but it's also quite sensitive. So something else that you will see a lot, particularly with African elephants, I've seen this a lot with African elephants, is they'll spray themselves with mud or they'll throw dust over themselves. And there's some brilliant video I've seen and brilliant photographs of an elephant just getting um, a trunk a trunk load of dust and just throwing it, spraying it over its its own body. And the reason that they do that is that their skin can be quite sensitive. It's sensitive to sunburn and it's sensitive to insect bites. So they spray themselves with mud and with dust as a way of um, putting sunscreen on and also protecting their, their skin from parasites. So That's basically why they do that. Now, that's also why they might appear to be quite strange colours at times. And that's generally because it's the colour of the mud or the dust they've been spraying themselves with. Okay, so um, obviously I've spoken about how endangered elephants are. And one of the things that puts them at more risk is that they have quite a long gestation period. They're gestation period is around 22 uh, 22 months so 
And, and usually in a herd, there'll be one breeding male. So there'll be a dominant male that mates with the females. And while that male is able to, um, it, while, while it's fertile, basically that's fine. But if the dominant male becomes infertile through age, that does mean that other males won't mate with those females. So that can be a problem. And it's a problem that has been noted in Namibia when I was um, over there. <clears throat> Now, um, once they're born, calves are pretty big. They're anything from 90 to 115 kilos when they're, when they're born. So they're, they're pretty big. They're actually able to stand within about 20 minutes of birth. And then after around two days, they're able to keep up with the herd. So obviously, from a survival point of view, that's very important. I've said that Elephants don't have any natural predators, but that's the adults. Obviously, any young animal is fair game, depending on its size. But um, a young baby elephant would certainly be um, something that a, a pride of lions could take down. So um, there is this need with any of these animals, and, and this is quite common in the wild, that newborns are, are able to stick with the herd in a very short time. So that if the herd has to move on or the group has to, to get out of the way for any reason, they've got the best possible chance of surviving. And as I've mentioned before as well, the elephants will, as a group, look after the young. So they tend not, unless an elephant, a young one wanders off, the group will protect it. So they, they do demonstrate that behaviour quite often. OK, so um, I'm going to just talk about the eating habits. So I've mentioned that they spend a lot of their day eating. That can be anything from 12 to 18 hours. They will deposit around, um, or rather they eat about 150 kilos a day. And that means they'll deposit in um, droppings, <laughs> let's say around one metric ton a week. So that's quite a lot. And um Elephant droppings do have various uses. Apparently, it's good if you the dried stuff. If you set fire to it, it keeps mosquitoes away. But I'm not, I can't testify to that. But um, apparently, that's one of the uses. But obviously, what they do is they're, they're um, processing vegetation. They're popping it out, and it, their dung is quite fertile. And in fact, uh, when I've seen fresh dung, they, it, it's kind of like a big party for dung beetles. And what I've noticed is that the new stuff is obviously quite warm as well because it comes out at body temperature. So if you do want to stick your fingers in there, it's quite warm. Um, obviously, it, get, it cools down over a period. And what I've noticed is you get different species of dung beetle having a party, a different party, depending on the temperature of the dung that they're using as a venue. So um, there you go. But So elephant dung, though, is important for fertilising the soil. It's also a great way of transporting seeds, both from plants and trees. So again, they're very important. They have an impact on the, the flora. One of the areas where they can be a problem if there's an overpopulation is that they'll tend to overeat the, the flora that's there. So certain plants, let's say it's taller plants, that might mean it's difficult for giraffe to feed in that area if their food source is gone. And with the taller plants going, that may allow the, the shorter plants greater sunlight, greater rain, and give them an opportunity to really get established and prevent the um, the taller plants from re-establishing, re-establishing themselves. So this is how they can make a difference to the flora of an area. And if you've seen where elephants have gone through, if you look at um, what they leave behind. Um, the, the word for that is <laughs> completely gone out of my head. Anyway, um, yeah, you, you've I've seen where elephants have gone through, and there's broken twigs and branches and all sorts everywhere. So they they can be very destructive, and this is also where they can come into conflict with with humans. And the biggest threats to them, poaching is a major one for elephant ivory from the tusks, which is is you know, just crazy anyway. That's a major threat to the elephants that are left. But of course, another threat to them is is our encroachment on their traditional um, 
ground, you know, the, the areas they would use to um, just travel and feed. And elephants can, as I said, can be incredibly destructive. That means for, if you're a farmer and even a small herd of elephants go through, they can do, do untold damage to your crops, to your infrastructure, your well, your water towers, anything like that. If you're trying to use solar power, that can be destroyed. So they can do an awful lot of damage. And this is why when I was in Namibia, EHRA, which is one of the projects I support through sales of my my photographs, they build solid infrastructure, so walls around these things. I was working on a water tower, but they do it so that the elephants can't get to it to destroy it. And they're also they also work very actively with the local population so that they can live in harmony with the elephants. And if you've listened to me speak about elephants in Namibia before, you'll know that um, I, I spoke to some local people when I was there, and they regarded elephants as almost a boogeyman. There was almost a superstitious fear of them because they can just pop up. They can travel a large distance overnight, and they can just suddenly be there. Elephants are very short-sighted. They can be easily startled if they don't realise a person is there, for example, and they might attack. And this is where these fat- often where the fatalities occur. So it is really important that we we where where people do live with um, wild animals like this, that there's um, support there to help them live together and also to help farmers have a a good quality of life. That's really important because they they see TV, they see what people have in the West and they want the same thing. So, um, you know, they don't really want to take one for the team so that elephants can continue. You know, that's not... That would be nice, but it's not how it works. So those of us who don't live with elephants, I think it's really important that we continue to support those who are trying to work um, and live alongside them. And I even saw some video recently, I think it was in India, where farmers, there was a small group of Asian elephants had gone through and they were actually, um, throw, I think, throwing fuel onto the elephants and setting fire to them to drive them out. So it can get pretty nasty and... Um, Obviously, a lot of work needs to be done if we're to keep these animals around so that future generations can see them. It does need um, a concerted effort to protect the animals, protect the areas they need, whereas at the same time allowing people to have a decent quality of life with them. So anyway, I've spoken quite a bit about that. So that's um, a bit of a... A bee that I have in my bonnet, as you've you probably um, noticed. So that really, I think, concludes what I wanted to cover on the elephants. So the idea of this was just to give you, um, hopefully, a, j- just some basic insights into some of these animals, a little bit of background to them, and hopefully there's one or two things in there that you weren't aware of. And the plan, as I say, is that I'll do more of these podcasts about a specific um, animal, uh, maybe maybe once a month or so, and uh, hopefully um, they'll be of interest to you. And if you want to see any of my photographs, obviously you can do on the website. Uh, if you go to um, ge.photography, I think that's www.ge.photography, but that's the that's my website. There are elephant, uh, well, all sorts of wildlife prints there for sale, and. What I do, a minimum of 10% of the money that I get from um, the sales of my fine art prints goes to uh, a couple of projects at the moment. And I'm also supporting um, uh, sort of planting trees. But the two projects right now are EHRA in Namibia, which is Elephant Human Relations Aid, where they're working with African desert elephants. And then the other one is a, a group called Half Cut in Sydney, who buy up plots of the Daintree rainforest in Queensland so that that can't be developed because rainforest is a, um, an extraordinarily rich um, environment for um, flora and fauna, and, and so much of it is unknown. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll speak to you in the next podcast. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Now, if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography, I suppose, my next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event 
because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address. Uh, once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So uh, if you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite. And um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, and www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.